All right. Hi, everyone. Welcome. Welcome to Lay's Real Talk. Okay, it's Tuesday, Wednesday. For me, it's the beginning of the week. For some of you, it's middle of the week. I hope you had a great start of the week. All right, let's uh, continue to talk about Chinese economy because I, I think I found some very interesting, um, how should I put this? Remember I told you a few times about the conflict between the central government and the local government. I talked about the factional war between uh, different political factions, but there's also a war between the central government and the local government. But I was never able to quantify that. I was never able to, I mean, that war is over economic matters. It's not so much political, right? The, 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 the conflict between the central government and local government is over financial matters. Um, hopefully today, by the end of today, I'm able to put a number, I'm able to quantify that dispute. So, um, so you understand the size of the problem. Um, so that's one of the things we'll talk about. Now, excluding Hong Kong and Macau, China has 32 administrative regions, including 23 provinces, five autonomous regions, and four direct municipalities. Of the 32 regions, some are wealthy and some are poor. It seems that only three cities or three municipalities and three provinces are doing okay financially, and they're carrying the entire country. The other 26 regions, as well as the central government, so 27, are draining resources from these regions, um, particularly the central government. It's the most expensive entity that the local economies support. We'll quantify that as well. Now, understanding China's economy is important because when, when China's economy melts down, it will happen locally. It will be local first. It won't be with an SOE. Um, remember a Taiwanese writer who I quoted, uh, who predicts that when, when local government collectively become insolvent for eight quarters or, or 48, no, or 24 months, um, 20, yeah, 24 months, two years, the regime has effectively disintegrated because it cannot control the local government. It will have, <coughs> excuse me, it will have effectively um, lost control over the local governments. So that's why understanding local government economy is very important. And that's what I'm dedicating this, this live stream to that topic. Um, so today we'll first talk about the six regions that are supporting the whole country. And then we'll quantify this central versus local financial war. Uh, like I said, it's very difficult for the outside world to understand China's economy, particularly at local level because of several factors. Let me share my screens. Maybe this is better. Um, the first is the lack of data integrity and access. Um, you know, we don't trust Chinese data. Um, it's often not realistic. And also we have very limited access to data. By the way, I've noticed that just this past few weeks, some of the detailed economic data that was available online are no longer accessible. And this includes some research papers and some, some portal that discuss, that discuss um, economic matters. It just happened, I think, over the last week or so. It may be still available inside China, but Beijing is definitely restricting access from outside. I think it will be more and more difficult for us to access China's economic data or any st statistics data. So we must rely on people from inside China to get the info for us. Uh, so that's challenge number one. And challenge number two is revenue and expenditures are mismatched when it comes to understanding local government eco economy or, or financial statements. Uh, this is because China has consolidated local and state revenue. Um, oh ch yeah, China has consolidated, you know how they, um, like the equivalent of IR IRS. 
So they have both the cent the state level agencies and then the, the local agencies. It used to be that the central agencies collect the central government managed tariffs or taxes, and then the locals manage theirs. Uh, Xi Jinping has consolidated them. So that everything is, is centrally managed now. Um, tax revenue is centrally collected and then allocated by the central government. So specifically, the central government has 50% of the revenue on its book while only paying 20% of the expenses. So the local government tax revenue reported in their financial statements is not the actual tax revenue they earned. So the tax revenue that uh, on their book, on their books, do not necessarily reflect the province's economic activities. Um, it's basically the leftover tax revenue after a share is allocated to the central government. Um, and, and this creates this mis, um, what I call mismatch. So it's hard to really understand how well each province's um, or each province is doing, right? Financially, because you, the expenditures and the revenues are mismatched. And the third is um, the local government's financial data is further skewed because of the central government's transfer payments. The transfer payments is what the central government allocates to local governments to help them stay afloat. Because they took a larger share, they took their revenue, these people can balance their book. So the central government turn around and give them a transfer payment. Um, it's just a way for CCP, for the central government to exercise its power over the locals. And this brings the third problem, because uh, even very wealthy regions like Shanghai, Shanghai technically does not need any financial support from the central government because it's able to uh, generate more tax revenue than, than, than it spends. But in, in the current system, um, the central government still allocates um, a transfer payment to Shanghai because it takes its tax revenue. So it's very convoluted when it comes to calculate um, the real financial standings of each locality. And the last, the reason is land concessions, pro proceeds, and then the hidden LGFVs, the local government financing vehicles, um, which is off the book, right? Which, the, the LGFVs um, are off the book but they're related to the, the real estate mar, uh, industry and then the, the land concession or the land sales. When I say land sales, some people ask me, it's not, it's lease. It's, um, it's a long-term lease, but they use the word sales in, in China. It's almost like a sales, but technically it's a lease. So these are like black, black holes that can skew the numbers for local government. So it's just very, very difficult. Now, I found a Chinese analyst who used, uh, who's very smart. He used a data tracked by the lo by local government. It's called total tax revenue originated locally. Um, he used that data to measure local tax revenue. Um, it's pretty much all of China's tax revenue except uh, the, the, the tax revenues truly controlled by the central government, like uh, import tariffs, right? Um, trade tariffs, those are controlled by the central government. So this is a very reliable number to use um, and it's truly managed by the local, by the local e uh, economies. Uh, so he used that and then let me go to the next slide. So this is this is just a very high level explanation about what China's fiscal revenue includes. So it includes tax revenue, um, and within that, we talked about how there's you know the, the majority of it is controlled by the local government. The central government only controls the tariff portion of it, and then you have non-tax revenue, and then you have government fiscal funds. This is the bucket where the land sale 
concession proceeds go to. So 90% of this bucket is land related, land sales related. And then you have revenue from state owned assets like the SOEs. And this pertains to lo both local and central. So, but the, but the revenue from uh, state owned assets is very small. So his uh, methodology is very simple. So he said, in order to, for us to understand local, the true picture of local financials, um, we need to, we need to, we, we need two numbers. One is the non-tax revenue for the local. And the second is the total tax revenue originated locally within that tax revenue bucket. So if we add up these two numbers, then those are, those, the total is a good indication of the local economic activities. And he excluded the, um, the, the, ex, the, what do you call that? The government fiscal funds, meaning the, the proceeds from land sales, because we want to exclude that black hole uh, that re related to uh, land sales, real estate, LGFVs, um, um, and also the interest payments for the local government debt. So basically, his method looks at looks at the operating income and losses of each local government um, by excluding, like I said, the debts, the real estate problem, the land sales. So the, that methodology assumes the most ideal situation for the local governments, meaning that assuming they don't have a debt problem, um, as, yeah, assuming they don't have, uh, you know, the real estate problem, they don't have any debt problem. Let's just look at purely operating income and tax revenue income, and then operating expenditures. And it is the most ideal situation for the local government, right? So let's Based on that assumption, let's look at the 32 administrative regions and to see who are profitable and who are not. So based on his calculations, only three cities and three provinces um, were, not, uh, were not in the red in 2022. Uh, so only these six regions were financially um, solvent or or the self-sufficient. So they are the three cities are Beijing, Shanghai, and Tianjin, and the three provinces were Guangdong, Zhejiang, and Jiangsu. Um, so let me show you the numbers. So here, here are the numbers uh, for Shanghai and Beijing. And <clears throat> I converted all of his number into billions, billions of yuan. So you see for Shanghai, um, tax revenue, and then non-tax revenue. So you have total fiscal revenue, and then you have fiscal expenditures, and the income. So for Shanghai, for, for last year, even though the city experienced three-month lockdown, um, it's able to generate uh, a, a fiscal income that's just slightly, it's over 2020 and 2019, but uh, slightly under 2021. And it has a 44% profit margin. Um, and for Beijing, it's similar, right? 49% 40, profit margin. Um, and so Shanghai is the region that contributes the most in terms of amount to the central government, in terms of a, a income, in, in terms of a profit, followed by Beijing. Um, now let's look at the other two. Now Guangdong and Zhejiang um, follow Beijing and Shanghai. Now Guangdong and Zhejiang are the manufacturing base. Uh, Guangdong includes Shenzhen, right? And Zhejiang has the world's busiest port. The Ningbo Zhoushan port is the largest port in terms of cargo tonnage. Uh, Unlike Shanghai and Beijing, these two provinces are heavily um, based on small to mid-sized private companies, and they're heavily in manufacturing. They employ more people and are engaged in labor-intensive work. So 
if you look at Guangdong's total tax revenue ranks first because it's 1.9 trillion. It's higher than Beijing and Shanghai. But because it has a, a lower profit margin, it contributes less fiscal, fiscal income to the central government. Um, and the same situation for Zhejiang. It has the same tax revenue as Beijing at 1.3 trillion. But because of the low profitability, it contributes only uh, 266 billion yuan as profit margin. Um, now, Guangdong and Zhejiang are two provinces that traditionally have a strong tie to commerce. The, the people from those two regions, uh, they're, they're famous merchants uh, that, that historically, many famous merchants historically came from these two provinces. Um, so people there work hard. They employ a large number of people. And um, there are more private companies there. And this is evident in their per capita comparison to Beijing and Shanghai. So if you look at the per capita fiscal revenue contribution to the central government, um, this, they're strikingly different. Beijing has the highest. So each person in Beijing contributed 31,000 or almost 32,000 yuan of uh, profit, right? Fiscal profit to the central government. And Shanghai is close to 30,000. But Guangdong and Zhejiang is much lower. It's 4,000. Um, what does that mean? That means that the type of industries are different. Guangdong and Zhejiang are the low, are the labor intensive um, manufacturing industry where people have a lower profit margin in their, in their, in their trade. Whereas Shanghai and Beijing have more high tech companies and more financial services um, companies that uh, those industries enjoy a higher profit, profit margin. So that just tells you that they're, they're in complete different uh, industry segments. Now, so here, here's the chart. So here's the chart across all 32 regions in terms of income and losses. You see how this is in billions of yuan. So there's only six uh, regions, three cities and three provinces that are, that are positive, right? And 28 are in the red. And if you look at to the far right, so the two, the two worst provinces are Henan and Sichuan. Uh, these two provinces are the traditional, are the traditional, how to say, are historically the two provinces that uh, always requires the most support from the central government because of their, they're always um, uh, in the red. Uh, but these two provinces are notorious for spending money on infrastructures. They're big spenders on infrastructures. And their cities are, they are newer and better looking than cities in Guangzhou and Hangzhou. So maybe that's why they, you know, they're always in the red or, or they're more in the red than the other ones uh, because they like to spend. Um, and so this is in terms of the absolute yuan. And this view is in terms of percentage. Oh, I need to make, make myself disappear. <laughs> okay. Um, how do I do that? Like that. Okay. So this is a percentage, the profit margin percentage, meaning their, their income or uh, loss over their revenue. And you see how Tibet, Qinghai, um, those remote provinces uh, to the west, in the west, western region of China, they, their expenditures are three times more than their revenue. So you see 3% negative, I mean 300% negative. So this one is in terms of percentage. Um, so Qinghai, Tibet, and Jilin is in the northeast. And you, 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 Jilin, Heilongjiang, are all like northeastern provinces. These provinces used to be uh, the most industrialized provinces in China. When CCP took took over in the 1950s, 19, late 1940s, these regions were very affluent. But look what happened to them now. They're very poor. Um, 
so yeah so so they they spend so the, the higher percentage meaning that they're they just spend uh that means that their tax revenue can only cover like a, a small fraction of their total ex total budget they mostly rely on central government transfer payment uh to to run their to run their government so that's the view in terms of percentage so let me come back so the three cities shanghai beijing tianjin and the three provinces Guang, guangdong zhejiang and jiangsu are the only provinces and municipalities that generate sufficient tax revenue to support their local governments and um and so they are oh, oh the other two i didn't mention one's tianjin one is jiangsu jiangsu actually contributes it has declined its revenue tax revenue has declined 15 percent so it's losing it's losing its status as one of the revenue contributing provinces so i would say the backbones the backbone of um, china's economy are these five um, three cities and two provinces beijing shanghai tianjin and then guangdong and zhejiang um, so then comes the next question how do they look for 2023 because the numbers I, I showed you were 2020 were from 2022 well i think 2023 will be a tough year recently employee protests broke out at shanghai's uh, pudong development bank china's ninth largest bank and uh, they protested over successive pay cuts some employees um, complained that their income was cut from 20 to 30,000 yuan a month to 5 to 6,000 a month. Now that's like 70% cut. And the cuts were not just to the staff level. It was um, everyone, including management, people who hold management positions, their pay was also cut. So 70%, you know, that's, that's a lot. Now, people in general don't expect staff working at banks in Shanghai protesting because they, they tend to think that those people have one of the safest job, jobs in China. Uh, so when these people put out signs in their cubicles or, uh, or gather in front, of the, the, in front of the building, their bank buildings, and the, when these pictures and, and videos were posted on social media, people were shocked. So that's Shanghai. Now, Beijing is the capital, and people would assume that CCP would not, we, we, CCP would do anything to keep the capital city strong economically, right? Well, not necessarily. Because remember, in my Sunday's program, I talk about the new capital city, Xiong'an that uh, Xi Jinping has built in uh, in Hebei, in the Hebei province. Like, uh, it's about, what? It's about two hours away from Beijing. It's it's 100 kilometers. Yeah, it's 100 kilometers away south to the south of Beijing. I had a whole program talk about that on Sunday. You can, you can watch it. But Be Xi Jinping plans to move 2.4 million people out of Beijing to Xiong'an this year. Now that's like 20 to 25% of the total population in Beijing. And this, when you, when you reduce, you, when you move 20 to 25% of the people from, 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 the, from, the, from a city, that will hit the real estate market, right? I mean, in a normal economy, that will, that will affect the, the real estate market. Not to say that China's econ uh, real estate market is already bleeding. So people are saying that, well, if that really happens, the, um, the real estate market in Beijing will tank and there will, there, there will be rippling effect. Um, so that's Beijing. Now, the, the declining exports and the exodus of supply chain will hurt the manufacturing uh, bases in Guangdong and Zhejiang for sure. And we know in Q1 2023, we've seen dramatic decline in exports. So if this continues, these two provinces will not be contributing as much tax revenue to the central government as the previous year. So I consolidated the budget um, and 
calculated this way for all 32 regions, and I came up with a set of numbers that are quite different from China's official fiscal budget. And the variance analysis inadvertently revealed how Beijing has controlled the local government throughout through all these years by controlling the tax revenue allocation. So let me show you the slide. Um, yeah, okay. So this is, um, what do I call this? This is, this is China, oh, this is China's official 2022 financial statement. So this is what it looks like. This is published statement. So uh, look at the, fiscal deficit, right? So the lo it looks like the local government is in the red, uh, has a deficit of uh, almost 12 trillion yuan, while the central government is in the black. It's It has a fiscal revenue of 9.4 trillion yuan with expenditure of 3.5. So, uh, so it looks like it's the local government that has the deficit that's insolvent or that's losing money. Um, so if you if you look, I circled the, the percentage, the total fiscal revenue percentage is 53% to 47%. It's almost like one to one. Whereas the expenditures is 86% to 14%. So th this supports the argument, um, the, the claim, I shouldn't say argument. This supports the claim that the central government controls almost half of the revenue, but the local government um, pays the bulk of the expense. And that's why the local government do not have the incentive uh, <laughs> to balance its budget, because no matter what it does, it's not going to balance the budget. And it has to rely on the transfer payment. Right. So it looks like the fiscal deficit is 100 percent at the very last line. The fiscal deficit is 100 percent local, zero percent central. So this is the official view. Now, let me show you my adjusted view. OK, so this is what I did when I consolidate. I was plugging numbers this afternoon for, for hours, <laughs> It, but it, it but it was fun. It, it brought back my uh, the memory of my financial analyst times. <laughs> So if I apply the adjusted um, view, right, based on the methodology I explained to you earlier, now you see how the fiscal deficit is equally distributed, right? So you have uh, the local government has um, 3.1 or 3.2 trillion yuan deficit. The central government have 2.5. And then look at the revenue. The local government generated 94% of the revenue. The central government, 6%. So this really hides, if you really look at this number, what it, what it says is the local government, the central government contributes very little to the Chinese economy, but spends a lot, right? So it contributes only 6%. To, to, to the to this fiscal revenue, but spend 14% of the expenditures and contribute to 44% of the deficit. So if you want to really compare, um, so I just compare the two percentage. So the official versus the realigned, lays realigned version, you see how the revenue, you know, shifts. And then the, the deficit, I have the two blue arrows. It's not 0%. It's 44%. Um, so with that, is that the last slide? I think that, yeah, that's, that's oh, oh yeah, here, here's, my, here's my calculation of, so in terms of this local versus central government dispute or uh, what do you call that, fiscal war, fiscal conflict, I, I, was, I said I was able to quantify it, yes. So if you, uh, it, it's the amount, so it's the delta between uh, 
the two versions of the number for the local government. So, so the local government's real share of deficit is only 3.2 trillion, not the 11.6 trillion. So this problem between the local versus central government is 8.4 trillion. So uh, as it stands now, the local government has an 8.4 trillion dispute with the central government if they can make their voice voices heard. Um, Lei has helped them quantify their problem. It's 8.4 trillion. Okay, so um, what does that mean? What does that mean for uh, what's the political consequences of, of, of this, right? You may say, well, Lei, you went through a lot of numbers, um, but what does that mean to the politics? What does that mean to, uh, to China or the, to the Chinese economy or to to the regime's stability. Well, I think it really presents a problem because, because this the, the local government generates 94% tax revenue, but only controls 53% of the tax of the tax, 53% uh, of it. The central government controls half of it and spends it on items that it deems important, such as the PLA, Belt and Road, foreign influence so on and so forth. It helps the local government through the transfer payments, and this is exactly how Beijing controls the local government, by making them depend on um, the big brother in Beijing. Uh, this model, I mean, it is problematic, but it, it has become so fragile now when China's economy is going down, because when the local people lose incentives um, to do anything with their economy, the central government cannot generate tax revenue. Uh, it can control whatever it wants, but it but don't forget it only contributes six percent of the revenue. So when the people behind the ninety four percent of the economy collectively l lie flat and do nothing, the central government will have nothing to rely on, to control, because 100% of nothing is still nothing. Um, and this is scary because when the local people just decided that there's nothing they can do, and this is not even the local government, I'm talking about the private businesses, right? When people feel like, the, 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 you know, there's no way they can, their business uh, is sustainable. They're just closing their business and putting money in the bank. Uh, for I mean, they, they're going to save whatever money they have in the bank. Um, they're not going to buy stock. They're just going to keep the money in the bank. That has already caused a, a financial problem for the regime because when you have all these, when your when your deposits, when your bank deposits increase. And there's no no financial loan activities. There's the people are not taking out debts. There are no, there are no commercial um, loan activities. Then the banks are going bankrupt because the banks make money. I made a short on on that topic. The banks make money when when people take out loans. When nobody is taking out loans, when people are not buying homes, when when businesses are not borrowing money but they're putting whatever money they have in the bank to earn the interest, the banks are, are not doing well. And that's exactly what's happening in China. So, so that's what I say, um, Beijing's secret weapon to control its local governments is causing a financial meltdown because you control them, you know, they're, they're the ones who, who earn you the bread, right? And then you kill them, you control them, you make them so upset. Well, no one is earning you bread. You know, you have nothing, you control nothing. And that's exactly what's happening in China right now. So I think this is, um, this is a serious problem. Um, before, I, we, were not, we, we don't know to what extent, because if you look at the budget, it seems that the central government controls a large share of the budget. So we think, ah, maybe it has money. But this analysis um, allows us to really understand where who generates the, uh, the money, who generates the tax revenue. And it puts a very realistic number 
in front of us so that we know it's a situation is very dangerous for Beijing. So with that, I wrap up my presentation. <laughs> a lot of numbers. Um, I will, uh, for those of you who are interested in getting the numbers, because the I went through, I basically transcribed all the numbers from, from that analyst, uh, from, from, from his video, it's in Chinese, all the numbers are in Chinese. If you are interested in getting the number, send me an email. I'll send it to you uh, because I, I cannot show it here. Um, it's just too much, too much data. It would defeat the, defeat the purpose of this discussion. But if you are um, doing work and want to have the details, please send me an email. I'll share that with you. All right. Um, let me see. Okay. All right, let me see. Uh, I'll go through the, the super chat questions first, real quick. From Brian Cobb, I've always doubted the economic data published by the CCP. Thanks for your effort. Well, thank you. Yeah, this is, um, this is all the data come from, it's the official number. I just think, um, I think what, what I was amazed by this, uh, this analyst obviously is in China, so <clears throat> they know how to find substitute data. Uh, <clears throat> and that's the insight that I think people living outside China are missing. Um, and also they have access to these, uh, to the detail level of data and we don't. Um, so, so it's, it's, I think his work is, is just tremendously valuable. Thank you. Thank you, Brian. <clears throat> Excuse me. <coughs> um, so if you send me questions, put my name uh, in the front so I know it's addressed to me. There are a lot of lively discussions. That's great. From Amy Lai. Thank you. Thank you for, thank you for your support. Um, let me see. All right. So let me see if people have questions for me. I'm going to go back a little bit and start halfway through. Let's see. I'm looking for my name. Um, all right. Um, maybe I've gone too, too, too far back. Oh, here's one. Lay. Good. Good evening. Good evening. <laughs> all right. Um, I, I've gone too, too far back. Sorry. Um, Okay, from Dean Velasco. Okay, thank you. All right. Um, okay, most of us. Okay, from Cha An Sun An Sun. Wow, what a name. <laughs> Hi, Lei. Any research or rather statistic, statistics being done from Shenzhen province population is indeed shrinking massively and is shrinking swiftly. Thank you very much. Any research on or rather statistics being done on Shenzhen? Um, I have not done any research on a particular province. I have seen new data being released at provincial level in the past week or so. Uh, I don't remember if I've, I've seen Shenzhen or not, but I'll keep an eye on that. Thank you. Ed C, uh, does China have a sales tax? That's a good question. I think they do, don't they? I have not been back to China for so long. I did not buy anything. So uh, I'm sorry if I can't, <laughs> I can't answer that question. So those of you who have traveled to China, you know, please help me here. Uh, from Steve Kim, great work, Lei. Your experience with numerical analysis and excellent presentation of the results really show through in your channel. Thank you. Well, thank you. I, I tried. I think it's based on the great work that some unknown Chinese analysts have already done. Um, I think the the credit should go to them. Um, I think I think in the future it will be more and more difficult for us to get real number out of China. Uh, so we we would just have to rely on them. Uh, those 
those people who have access to the data, who are not afri- afraid to, to, to speak up and to release them. I think it's, it's great. Um, have the loan from Stephen Gilly, any guess on what the real reserve rate that most banks in China are keeping? Not the official rate, but actual loan deposits. Um, I need to look into that. Um, that's that's an interesting question. The the exchange rate. Yeah. Um, Moon Walker, could some of the six profitable provinces you talked about be also in the red because everyone up and down the government lie on their financial numbers? It's possible. Uh, it's very possible because at this point we're using their number. Um, we're using their number, but if you think about it, I think for Beijing and Shanghai, it's hard because they have a profit margin that's 40, 49% and 44%. I don't know how you can cook your book by that margin. Maybe for Guangdong and, and um, Zhejiang, it's possible because their profit margin is what, 22% and 18%. You could inflate your your revenue by that much and then you could, or you could, you know, deflate your um, expenditure. So that it's possible for those uh, less profitable localities, but for Beijing and Shanghai, I think they are, they are profitable because 44% and 49% is, is hard to, it, it will be a lot to fake, although it's still possible. So, um, so let me see, from Sinan, is the lack of profit why banks are limiting withdrawals? The banks, the banks that are limiting withdrawals are the banks that probably have, um, I think the banks have all sorts of problems. The banks are limiting withdrawals. The banks are also limiting, uh, limiting the number of people who are paying off their debt. Uh, there are people who want to pay off their mortgages ahead of time or reduce or refinance. In, in, this, in our world, we say refinance their mortgage so they have uh, less monthly payment. But the bank is, is, uh, is reducing that. It's limiting the number of people who can pay off their debt. And this is really strange. So you have both. You have people limiting, you have banks limiting withdrawals. Probably they have liquidity problems. And then you have other banks that that are limiting the number of people who can refinance their debt. Okay, thank you. Let the tunes flow. Thank you. All right. Um from Aviation Media 24. So laying flat is a weapon against the CCP. I think at this point, it has become a weapon, but I think it's people's response. People, I mean, what can they do? Um, this, you know, people are losing hope, right? When you, people are just seriously demotivated. I saw um, a family member forward me an article written by a young person in Shanghai. That person has been trying to live on a 10 yuan per day budget. So that's like 300 yuan a month in, in Shanghai. And this person even showed like, I mean, he cooks for himself or, or I think it's a him. Um, and yeah, it's just very sad. Um, you know, 10 yuan a day. All right, let me see questions. Um, Texas Panda, how do you think moving to digital currency will affect the data? I uh, made a video on that. Moving to digital currency would definitely allow CCP to, you know, control control everyone better, right? It will also it will also um, it, by eliminating paper money, it will effectively 
how to say, it, it will be able to eliminate the money, the paper money, the cash. There's a, a significant amount of cash that are being held in private hands because of corruption, because people, uh, they can't take money. I mean, they, they take cash and these money will become wasteful paper, wasted paper when the currency is converted to digital. So, so yeah, so the government definitely wants to use the digital currency to control the government officials, uh, trying to use that to, to curb c corruption and also monitor people's transaction. It will, I mean, basically your entire life becomes transparent. It can see everything you buy, every transaction, right? And that's scary. From Charles Womack, when would it be appropriate to call someone Zhou, Zhou Go or running dog? Um, Zogo. It's not a very nice word to say to anyone. <laughs> so, it, CCP likes to use that word a lot on people. Um, so, I wouldn't. I wouldn't use that word. You know, only because it's being used. Always, it's always used by CCP. Um, so I, I would not, I would stay away from that word. There are other words you can use to, to describe people you don't like, but I would stay away from that word. All right. Um, from Jeff Ramos, what percentage of the Chinese people have restricted access to cash? There were lines since 2022. I think the people who have restricted, I don't know what percentage, but the people who have restricted access to cash is because their money are gone. Uh, the people from the village banks, they still haven't got their money back. Remember there were protests more than a year ago during summer where people, was it last summer, last spring? People just all of a sudden saw their money gone. Um, and then the government compensated or, or gave the money back to those um, customers, the customers of the bank who have smaller amount. But the people who have more money, um, the people who have more money in the account, they, they, they still haven't got their money back. So they're still fighting. Th these people certainly have restricted access to cash. Um, we don't hear about these things as, as much as before. I don't know if it's because it's being censored. Uh, here and there, we may we may hear it occasionally, but it, it can be censored. All right. Having a saving disappear is scary. Yes, that has happened to to um, to Chinese. Okay. Uh, Neset Gane, do you think do you think that the yuan will ever get to the level of the U.S. dollar, given its strict control over its currency and not letting it flow freely like the U.S. dollar? You, you said it right. No, it would never get to the level of the U.S., precisely because it's not a freely traded currency. Who wants to hold on to a currency that you cannot trade, right? And then that has the risk of becoming a pile of paper one day. I, for that reason, no, I don't think it will ever... Um, have the status as as the dollar, even though that's the ambition that the CCP has. Uh, from Chris, Chris Hamlin, thank you. Um, from Max Shredder, hi Lei, thanks for the videos. What part of China are you from? You look like a northern Chinese. Um, <laughs> I think my ancestors are from northern China, but where I grew up. Uh, while I was born and grew up uh, is in the South. So, and that happens to a lot of Chinese, you know, because you grew up where your parents, uh, where your parents are, and then the parents have been reshuffled by the CCP, right? All, all over the country. So, so I, I yeah. 
<laughs> All right. Okay, that seems uh that seems to be that should be that seems to be all the questions. I thank you everyone for joining me and I'll see you next time. Okay, enjoy the rest of your night or day. Bye bye. <laughs>